Yeah, so my presentation is on Kaira in uh, a nutshell, and, and Kaira means the Copernicus Arctic Regional Reanalysis, so it's a kind of a, a sister project to the CERA, the European Reanalysis. So this presentation is, is with input from a lot of my, my colleagues. So I just start with the slide to set the scene a little bit. Why are we interested in, in the Arctic and, and monitoring the climate in, in the Arctic? Oh, so yeah. this... This illustrates this uh, phenomenon, which we call Arctic amplification and, or polar uh, amplification. So what, what we see in observations and also in, in the climate scenarios from the models is that Arctic in general warms roughly twice as fast as the global average warming. So this is illustrated in this figure to, to the right, which are from the previous uh, models used in the previous IPCC report where they have calculated average temperature trend over the period 1900 to 2100 with one of the climate scenarios. So what you actually see here is that the uh, Arctic is a kind of a, a hot spot in, in the global warming. So we see that if you look at the trends you find in this model in Northern Europe and compare it with the models in what they give in the maximum in the Arctic, it's uh, two to three times as, as much as what you see in, in terms of warming trends uh, over, for instance, continental Europe. So this means that there's a request for understanding and managing the change processes that we see in the Arctic. Of course, this picture to the right is a very big picture. It's the yearly average. Uh, annual average. Uh, so it, it actually hides a lot of detail in, in the changes. It varies between the seasons. There are a decline in the sea, I say, etc. So there are lots of details that are interesting to, to look into here. No, we also see that there's increased economic activity in the Arctic. So this is a kind of a motivation for why, <laughs> why, why we are, are, are doing an Arctic uh, reanalysis. So this is led by Met Norway. So the partners are the, the Nordic countries and, and Meteo France, the weather services in, in this, these uh, countries. Um, this is, uh, we have actually not been working uh, on this with uh, before this uh, project or this service we are running now. So we are actually a, a new team working on, on this from a few years back in time. So we, we have to draw on the heritage of, of the reanalysis project, and we also have numerical weather prediction systems running in the Arctic in both N Norway and, and Denmark. So that's what we, we base ourselves on. And, and at the bottom left there, you can see the various work packages we have and, and who is leading the, the different work packages and, and the institute they, they come from. Yeah, so this uh, is just to give an overview of the domains we are working on. It's the two domains on, on the top. So we are running two, two limited areas, uh, two, and a half, two and a half kilometer horizontal re resolution. We're running the period from 1997 to 2021. So you can compare this to the larger SADA domain for the south that uh, Semyon presented, which is running five and a half kilometers of a coarser resolution. So we are running even finer resolution in the Arctic, and we, but we are running a shorter period than, than the European Union. A little bit now about uh, the system. So for these two domains, we, we cover basically the European sector of, of the Arctic. We do not cover everything yet. The system we use is a so-called Harmony Arom NWP system, which is a non-hydrostatic convection permitting model for those familiar with numerical weather prediction. As I said, we, we are running very similar models for our operational weather forecasting in Arctic, both in Denmark and Norway. So we, we benefit from being close to that system and the experience we have with that. We cover this 24-year period, as I mentioned. We over lateral boundaries we get from era five, so we very much benefit from from the impact we get from the boundaries from era five, and we try to add value then by by scaling it down and using local observations inside the the domain. So the main target for us is to to provide more value, more detail than than what you get from from the era five system. So we have ex extensive use of upper satellite data, which is obviously important in the Arctic, where you have gaps in the observing system. 
we benefit from uh, the era 5 uh, observation usage we take their blacklist as a starting point and then we add on with with local data the system does the so-called 3d var data assimilation we have three overly cycling uh, with observation input the data set has an overly resolution we have done particular work to account for what we can call code surfaces to, to describe the surface well in, in, in the system, CES, glaciers, snow, etc. And the production we do at the ECMWF high performance computer facility in, in, in Reading. So the time schedule for, for our work, we started in September 2017 with an extensive development and, and testing phase. And then we were ready to start production around the summer last year. So I get back to how far we have come now in the production. But we have now an aim for an upcoming November to do the first public data release of a part of the data set. So, so that is a soon upcoming target, which will make the data available for the public, which is, is which it is not yet. And we will run up until uh, the project will run up until August uh, next year, uh, and then we will have completed the production up production up to June 2021. And what will happen beyond the summer of next year that we don't know yet. We had the introduction from Samantha, so this is the end of the first Copernicus phase. And there is, of course, discussion going on between ECMWF and, and the EU on, on the follow-on. So we, we hope that this follow-on will also include the follow-up phase of, of this Arctic reanalysis beyond mid next year. So this slide is to show you what we can gain by adding resolution and compare to, to era 5. So to the left, you see a map from our system and to the right, you see uh, a map from, from the era 5 output data. So uh, for those who, who recognize the Arctic, you will recognize the topography of, of the Svalbard, the Spitsbergen area. Um, and what this shows is the one month average temperature for, for Svalbard in January 2017. But what you see here is that you, you get much more resolution. You resolve uh, the topo topographic effect much uh, better with, with the, our system. So we are actually able to add quite a lot of detail, which is potentially important for, for many applications of, of, of the data to have, have more detail to go into the valleys and up on the glaciers, etc., to, to get more realistic data. Yeah, so I have a slide here on efforts on surface and local input data sets to improve the reanalysis. So this is partly also to to advertise for the presentation given later today by Christian on, on the dedicated input data sets for the Arctic. So the figure to the right illustrates uh, some of the tasks in this uh, input data work package that we have, have had on top of a picture of a, from the Arctic, from, from Greenland, where you can see some of the things we have to handle when you want to describe the surface in the model. Physiography in the Arctic, which in some places is not so well mapped. We have glaciers that we need to deal with. We have ocean, which also can contain sea ice and actually is covered by sea ice much of the year. We need to deal with snow, which is important for the Arctic. And of course, we also need to deal with what we deal with every, everywhere else on, on, on the conventional surface uh, data. So Christian will give a more detailed presentation later on on, on these aspects. I also have a slide here to, to advertise for uh, Morten Kölso's presentation later on, on how our system verifies and, and how it adds value to, to global reanalysis. So I have put up uh, a, a figure here showing uh, how the RMS errors for our systems are when you compare to observations in, in, in the domain. This is both for mean sea level pressure, wind speed, and temperature. And, and the red is what we get from the Arctic regional system, and the blue is what we get from Era 5. And so, yeah, so this is a kind of a, a big piece, picture message. And 
what it shows and what Morton will go more into detail in is that to a large extent we fit observation better than, than era, era 5. So, so Morton will provide more information about, about this. So this figure shows where we are in the production of the data sets. So the three bars on the top here is the production for the east domain with the time along the horizontal axis. So the production is uh, going on simultaneously in three streams for the east domain. And the bars on the bottom is for the west domain in red. Uh, so the West Domain, which is slightly larger, we have divided into five streams. So we see we have already completed three of the streams from for the for the West Domain, and we are close to completing also several of the other streams. And we have done eighty three percent of the total production by this week. Uh, this does not mean that we can make everything public. Uh, of what we have produced public in the climate data store immediately because we have some backlog in transferring the data into the so-called Mars archive at ECMWF, uh, which is then the baseline for putting the data into the climate data store. So the figures to the right is what we have been able to so far to ingest into the Mars archive. So uh, we have much more gaps in what we have <laughs> introduced in Mars here than for the actual production. So this means uh, we, are, we are not quite ready with everything we have produced to, to publish it yet. So, but for November, at least, we will be able to, to, to publish both domains for 2018 and a bit dependent on the tec technicalities and, and the bottlenecks and what we can do. We will, we will possibly also uh, publish uh, something more than just the year 20, 2018. And, and by summer next year, we will, uh, we will have the full 24 years time series published. Yeah, so I should also mention that we have already got several requests from potential users who have heard about our work and interested in, in the data availability, particularly from people working on glacier modelers that need to look at glacier arms. They need horizontal resolution uh, to, to be able to force the, the glacier models. So we have had several requests from people working with that. and we. I also have a lot of interest in what we are doing as a part of this year of polar prediction. There, there, there has been many projects there uh, focusing on the Arctic who has asked us about the data. I should also mention that we are doing some work to prepare for what will hopefully be the next generation of Arctic reanalysis. So we have a pilot study to do a pan-Arctic model setup, which is then we move a bit more away from what we are doing in the numerical weather prediction systems we are we are running for our daily forecasting. So we have to do some extra work to set up such a system, but we will do a one-year Pan-Arctic pilot reanalysis as to pave the way for the next generation. And this Arctic Pan-Arctic reanalysis we cover the period from se September 17 to 18. So this will be a part of the year of, of polar prediction. Yeah, so of course we invite input from potential users. It's also important for us to understand what we should focus on for, for the next phase of, of Copernicus. There is always trade-off when you set up an numerical weather prediction system for reanalysis. The analysis period length, domain size, resolutions, how we do a simulation, what we do for uncertainties, etc. So we are very happy if you can provide input in the upcoming survey or in, in the discussion session in, in the end that could help us uh, help us in being informed about, about what is needed for, for the next phase of, of Copernicus. So that ends my presentation.